Well, I think um, I think I we're at eleven. I know we've we've got a few people. There may be some more people joining us, but I I think what we'll do is I won't ask you. Unlike last night, I won't ask you to um, mute if you don't wish to. Um, and if you have questions as we go along, I would prefer this to be a little more interactive than we were last night. So, um, and, and that may stretch it out a little bit, but if you have questions as we go along, I think that's definitely the way to go. And if you, if you wanna turn on your video, that would be fine. Um, uh, and if you choose not to, that's also okay. But um, again, not. if you uh, just go ahead and interrupt me, if you know how to use the raise hand function. Uh, I do a lot of Zooming where I teach. And so um, if you know how to use the raise hand function under the react, depend on what version you have on the, under the reactions uh, tab, uh, that's fine too. And I can see that in the, um, in the, uh, on my screen. So um, we, we'll get started. I won't keep you and let me share the screen. So welcome to Joyce and Susan as well. And the idea here is to give you a virtual tour of West Newbury. And, and I know that you all are gonna wish that your favorite tree on your favorite <laughs> tree was in this, but, but it, uh, <laughs> it, it's more like if you're driving around what you might notice in a few spots. And also um, the other thing is that when I put this together and took all the pictures of the trees, it was within the last month or so. And as a result, um, there, you know, trees were not leafed out. So the identifications that I did were all by bark. Um, and so I'm pretty confident on, you know, virtually all of them, um, but I certainly would be more comfortable if I went back and sort of ground truth that with with the leaves when they come out but i'm uh, but i think i got it pretty well um i i do have arborist training so I, i'm not a total novice on the other hand some of these are uh, can be quite confusing and that's part of what i think we'll do today um so certainly west newbury has some wonderful trees and that's we really are blessed with a little bit shy of 60% tree cover in town. And this is this is just up the hill from us. Just to, uh, I just happened to take this uh, shot uh, last fall, this picture. And, you know, I'm getting at the, that bright yellow one towards the left is a hickory, but, and, and that the brownish one all the way to the left is an oak. But, you know, you can see just in this one shot, we've got sort of our, our five of our most favorite um, uh, uh, species here, and we'll see how to uh, identify those. Uh, if, if you think that uh, since we uh, have a few enough people, if you think this is a little too basic, feel free to let me know, like you know all this, um, but, and we can talk a little bit more in detail, but uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, and here's, here are the spots <laughs> that, we'll, that we'll stop. Uh, along the way on our virtual tour. And uh, that star in the middle means nothing other than the numbers that on the PowerPoint didn't go up to 10. So I put something in for Mill Pond. Um, before we go start on our tour, the question is always, well, what are the best books for tree identification? And I have some suggestions. Uh, they're not by no means um, the absolute best, it's, it's always a question of personal um, preference and whether you want photographs or you want drawings um, and what kind of information you want. But I'll, I'll, I'll give you, there's six, there are three on this slide and three on the next. And on the tree committee website, there's a pretty long bibliography of a number of trees. These, these are, the one on the left is my go-to book. Um, and it's, it's broader than just uh, the East. So you do get California species, but I just really think for me, that's, the, that's the, the best tree book. But again, Audubon has got uh, their book out, which is photographs. The Sibley book is drawings. The one in the middle, I find really good. It's got a lot of pictures of bark and it's a photographic book. 
And I found, for me, this is the best photographic book. And the one on the right, The Golden God, has been around forever. But it's really good because it's got a number of trees on the same page that, are, that might be confusing. And when we get to the oaks, you'll see what I mean. There's a page that I've copied from that that really help in identification because you can see all the, all the ones that you might either know or be mistaking for the one you know on one page and it's really helpful. The, there are a couple others that I've found that are really um, a little bit more off the beaten track but really useful. Bark is a terrific book. I've heard him talk and he made the point that around in New England where we live, generally speaking, we have only bark to identify trees at least half the year. Mm -hmm. He said even more than half, when I count on my fingers, it depends on the weather, but at least six months, there are no leaves to help us out. So bark is one good way of identifying trees. Uh, the one in the middle is not really a beginner's guide, it says it, but it's really good in comparing trees that you might uh, again be mistaking uh, one for the other. And then these little pocket books on tree finder and winter tree finder, especially winter tree finder, because it's got a lot of the buds uh, in that book. In any event, th these are the ones that I like and that I tend to use more often than not. I've probably got a shelf full of another dozen or so tree, tree books. Um, and of course, you can go to the website. Uh, and I've circled where you can find um, a, a list of all the trees. Well, Let's uh, start on our trip into West Newbury. And my question is what tree sticks out above all the other trees in West Newbury? On that horizon, you can see these, these green trees here. Does anybody know? It's always the same. It's the same answer, the wherever we look. <laughs> white pine, Eastern white pine. And the reason is because these are the ones that, as Casey heard last night, repopulate cleared agricultural lands first. So they get a head start on the hardwoods. So when you look at some of the vistas that we have, that, that green layer above is going to be eastern white pine. The spruces generally, you know, they're not nearly so common. So how would you know an eastern white pine? And you can see in the lower right, that's Mill Pond. There they are all these white pines sticking up above the, the hardwoods in the foreground. Five long needles, five long soft needles in a bundle sheet. They're sort of a, it looks like it's glued together with a piece of tissue paper or something at the very base, that's the bundle. You can snap it off from the twig and, and the five needles come out together. And it's the only five needle pine in Eastern United States. It's got a long slim, curved cone. So that's the white pine. And here, here's what I think is just a great diagram. Um, here's, here's the white pine with five needles in the bundle, if you will. The pitch pine, which we also have, but it, which is much more common on Cape Cod, has three. And I remember that because three, three strikes and you're out in baseball, you know, it's a pitcher, and so it's pitch pine. So I remember three for that. And then red pine's just the other one, <laughs> which, has, which has two needles. Um, there may be some jack pine around. I haven't really found, I don't think I've found any. And they're really short needles of two. So we're talking the long needle pines here. Uh, spruces have very short, stiff needles um, and so, and pointed. So that's the ones when you, stick your hand in and you're trying to decorate a Christmas tree or something and, and you, you get stuck. Um, so here we are. So that's, that's the white pine and a little bit on pines. And so we're gonna stop by uh, the Grant Farm first. And when you come in from Newburyport, the first thing you see before you get to the farm stand is this gigantic, gorgeous weeping willow. And these are pictures I took uh, probably two weeks apart um, and I believe that this is one of the, this is a called a golden weeping willow. Um, uh, but in any event, it's just, it's just a wonderful tree and everybody should know, I think everybody pretty much knows that one by sight. 
But how about these? These are the ones that are in front of the farm stand. Mm. And, you know, well, they look brown, they all look the same, whatever. Well, two of them are ash and two of them are elm. And so you say, well, how do I identify ash uh, leaves? And then we'll talk about the emerald ash borer, which may make this a little bit academic over the next decade. But along with maple and dogwood, the ash are, have opposite leaves. And they are opposite sort of in two ways. One is where this compound leaf, which is this whole thing, connects to the stem and it's opposite another, another stem. Uh, also, in some ways, you could say that the leaflets here, which are all part of this whole leaf, which has these subparts, uh, are opposite each other. So this is an ash, it's five to nine leaflets arranged, and they're slim, that it, narrower leaves than hickory or than um, maybe walnut are, or walnut has more, walnut may be as slim, but it has more leaves per, per uh, the more leaflets per leaf. So this is an ash. And, but to me, the, the easiest thing to do is to look at the bark and you see these little, um, it's almost like a diamond shape in this area. It's where the vertical, the vertical uh, ridges in the bark choose to intersect with their neighbors. So if you sort of follow one down, there's like, it's intersecting here. You follow this down, it's intersecting here. So, and there are two kinds of ash, the white and the green. A uh, green are pretty common because we have a lot of wet places in West Newbury. And white ash is a little bit more of the upland ash. We have both. How do you tell the difference if you care? Well, the leaflets here are a little bit tighter to the, to the stem. And they also have little wings. I have a picture coming up next that helps you if you care. Uh, they're both was seriously threatened by the emerald ash borer. Um, here's a picture of you where that little um, le uh, that little winged leaflet is right here where it joins up. Notice it's not a very long um, uh, stem and it's just got this little, it's almost like a buttress here. Uh, that's a green ash. And this is a picture of a healthy green ash on the left. Um, it's got a different form than the oaks and the maples, but uh, it's, it can be a really nice tree. Unfortunately, they're probably all going to die, at least, at least well above 90% of the town are going to die. And you can see, this is on my property. I've had it in Um This is by the road, so it's hard to say if it's road-caused stress or it's emerald ash borer. But you know, the thinned crown, it really does not look nearly so nice as the one on the right. And then of course, in the middle is uh, Pipe Stave Hill below the solar field and all that die off. They're all uh, ashes and they're all due to this emerald ash borer that you don't see attacking the tree for the first two or three years uh, because it, 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 the larvae burrows in and eats this cambium layer, which is really sort of the arterial system that moves uh, water up and water and nutrients up to the leaves and moves the, the sugars from photosynthesis down to the rest of the tree. And they eat all that layer. So the tree can't really transport any of the materials it needs to live, and, but it's under the bark. So you can't see it while this is happening until the tree dies. And, and then it dies within a year or two um, completely. Uh, so you look for signs of stress in the crown, uh, you know, thin crown. You look for ex excess growth on the lower trunk where you shouldn't be having branches. Sometimes you can see this, this woodpeckers can try to detect these or can detect these emerald ash borers and they try to uh, chip their way through. And so it's called blonding, but it's tough. And we can talk about, you know, getting the trees injected if you want at some point. So those are two of the four trees in front of the grant stand, the, the two what I think are green ash. And the other two are American elm, uh, which as we know used to line Main Street. It's got a much, again, it's vertical strips and intersecting bark and almost these diamond shapes, but it's, it's a much um, more deeply furrowed uh, uh, bark. 
And you can see the elm leaf when it comes out is very, uh, very uh, distinctive uh, with its uh, asymmetrical base and these double toothed uh, margins. This is a picture I took of, the, of this tree in front of the grandstand when its flowers came out this spring. They come out just about the same time or ever so slightly after the red maple. So this is a very early flowering tree and it flowers this sort of pale green from a distance. The two elms look to be like they're gonna do fine instead of the grant and in front of the grant vegetable stand. Right now, there's no evidence of life on the ash and I don't know whether they're just slow to leaf out or whether or not they're dead. Um, so we'll see. Well, when you go immediately past the Grant uh, vegetable stand, you hit Norino Drive. And if you look to the right, you see all these birches into the distance. You see there's a whole line of them here and there's another one here and here's a close up. So the question that I have for you is, do you, do you know which birch these are? Well, I sort of doubt that they're white birch because aren't they all dying too? No, they're okay. Yeah, white birch sometimes struggle with, uh, all the birches struggle with this yeah. bronze birch borer. But what about, um, what about, so you said white birch, I'd rather call it paper birch. Paper birch. Uh, and so that's what you think. And that, that's a great guess. Um, there's a problem with that guess, which is, well, no, that's a good guess because doesn't it look like some landscape person that developed the properties just put a bunch of them in a line for landscaping purposes. Yes, it does. It does. So immediately you got to think, maybe there's something different because a landscaper has all these uh, cultivars and varieties from China that have white bark. So you just sometimes don't know. Let's see if we can hone in on it. Well, here's the gray birch now. No peeling bark like the paper birch, so we'll see that next. And it's got a lot of these upside down V's, which are called chevrons. It's where branches have broken off. And so one of the ways to tell a gray birch from a paper or white birch is these chevrons and no peeling bark. And also the leaf, which of course is not out yet, is different. It's much more pointed. Well, let's look at the paper birch. Here's the paper birch. And if, you, if we saw this on the Norino Drive birches, birches with, the, with the peeling bark and, and these horizontal peeling layers, or we could see this more rounded leaf that's not quite as pointed here as the gray birch, we could be able to identify. The problem is with paper birch is that it hybridizes freely. So you may, <laughs> you may have something that's an intermediate. It's really hard to tell. Um, so what's the best guess? Well, anybody? Do you see peeling bark? No peeling bark. It looks like some chevrons. And looks like chevrons. So what would be yeah, a, it'd be a gray bark better gray guess? Birch, yeah. Gray birch. Yeah, that's what I think. Um, and But who knows, because of this, the way it looks so uh, landscaped, if you will. Well. Mm -hmm. That's just, to, that's just to give you a headache for the, uh, for the birches. Um, and by the way, so far as I know, the only tree that, the only birch that, and we're gonna see it in a minute, that is somewhat better at withstanding this bronze birch borer is the uh, river birch. And we'll see that in a moment. Um, now we're gonna see an oak in a minute. And I don't know whether you know about the two groups of oaks, the red oak and the white oak. Um, you might. The, these are the bristle tips here. And these are the, uh, and that's the red oak group. And these are the white oaks here with these rounded tips, these rounded lobes, they call them. That the indentations, these U-shaped indentations are called sinuses. So we have sinuses and we have lobes. If it's got these bristly tips, which are thinner than, than, than teeth, um, it's in the red oak group. So why do I say this now? Oh, oh. and now here's a picture before we get to the, uh, the, the oak on Norino Drive. 
Here's just a picture on the left of the white oak group, some of them. And on the right <clears throat> is a picture from that golden guide where you can see the confusing oaks, the red, black, scarlet, and pin oak. They're all bristle tips and you can see how much alike these leaves look. You can use acorns as a help, but we're gonna talk about how deep the sinuses are, how much distance there is between the sinuses across the midrib, and that's a help. So keep in mind that if it's not a white oak, it's gonna be confusing with the bristle tips. And here's one right on the Reno Drive near, near the birches. And this is very distinctive. And we're gonna see this again on the training ground. Does anybody know what tree this is? What oak? Oh, it says pin oak right pin there. Oak. <laughs> How do you know it's a pin oak? Because of these bottom branches that grow mm -hmm. downward and the middle branches, branches that grow laterally and the upper branch, oops, the upper branches that go upward. And you can see it from a distance. And once you know what to look for, you can drive down the street and you can say, oh, there's a pin oak, there's a pin oak. This shape is so distinctive. And it's not really, it's not a broad crown. It, it's more columnar, it's more, it's more vertically oriented, if you will, it, or slimmer. Um, there's not just a, a slim bottom and then a broad crown, it's sort of slim all the way up or, or maybe equidistant. Anyway, and you can see the pin oak leaf this is the one that has very, it has the least distance between the two sinuses at, across the midrib. So it's the most pinched in, if you will, or the most indented. Uh, that's a pin oak. That's pretty easy to tell, or the easier. When you go into Reno Drive, you'll see the red cedars. Uh, there are a lot of them. The one on the lower right has this golden hue because it was in, it, uh, these were little, um, this was new growth coming in and it, and it was came out as brown and then it'll of course turn green. And you can see what the, what the red cedar looks like. The bark is red and sort of scaly, if you will, or overlapping plates. And then the, it, the while it's an, it's an, uh, con, it's an evergreen, uh, it's really got, doesn't have needles. It sort of has overlapping scales, but this is a common tree, very common in West Newbury. Well, Here's the river birch that I mentioned. The one that if you, it's very, it's used a lot decoratively or landscape wise. Um, it has among the better resistances to the borer and the bark is really unmistakable. It's this reddish brownish bark that just peels off everywhere, not in strips, but in all directions. And of course the leaf is, is different than the two birch leaves we saw, the gray birch was, which, which was more pointed and the rounder paper birch. But it's the bark that you can see all year round and that really is, um, and here's a, a little bit of a close up. Th this, this is pretty unmistakable. There's a great one on River Road too that will come across in a little while. Well, what about this? <laughs> What about these <laughs> white flowering trees in West Newbury that you just don't know? Are they, are they cherries? Are they pears? Are they something, service berries? What are they? Well, just take a look at the form of the tree on the left versus the form of the tree on the right. The form of the tree on the left is this beautiful sort of conical pyramidal shape. And the one on the right is really just growing in all different directions. From the form alone, you know they're different. And the one on the left is the one that's the bad one. And it's all over the place. And landscapers love it. And it's an invasive. And it's a calorie pear. And if you've got one in your yards, I apologize for being negative about it. But it is definitely, it, it used to be planted everywhere because it is fast growing, hardy, withstands sort of more like urban environments. And the problem is, is that it's, it's invasive. It can, um, it can pop up in places where it was never planted. And it, it's not like kudzu or like uh, oriental bittersweet, but it's viewed as an invasive tree. One on the right is a cherry. 
white flowering cherry, I believe, because I need to check once the leaves come out, because it could be another variety of pear. But the one on the left is the one that you're going to see. Once you start looking for this pyramidal shape and white flowering early in April in, or in April right now, uh, it's calorie pear. And here you can see if you went by the blossoms, the blossoms are, are pretty much the same between the cherry on the right and the pear on the left. Uh, to me, they're five petals and they have these long stamens and they're about the same. Here's, here's, the, here's the quote I found on the internet. Good thing gone bad. And you can, you can see what this person had said about it, which is you didn't plant it and all of a sudden you've got these trees. Uh, and it's fine. There's nothing wrong with the way they look, but they do, they do spread um, unrestrainedly. So right now, and sometimes they're known as Bradford pears. That might be something that you remember, but calorie pears or calorie Bradford pears are pretty much frowned upon by anybody who's doing, who's paying attention to native planting and trying to avoid anything that has invasive tendencies. So we'll leave Norino Drive. We'll leave, let the residents <clears throat> remain in peace there and we'll head towards Coffin Street. But first we're gonna stop at Way to the River Road. That intersection, you can see the street sign right here and that old church building. Um, and in front there is what I consider to be, at least so far as I have seen, the best American elm in town. It's just gorgeous. It's right by the road. When you drive by, you, you can see this vase-like shape. And this is, this is in April when it's, the flowers are, um, have turned a little bit on the brownish side of the of the of the yellowish brown that they that they start with, but this tree looks like it's very healthy and either has been treated or is otherwise resistant to the Dutch elm disease, which wiped out virtually all of our elms in the 1950s and 60s. So take a look at this one when you go by way to the River Road. And also, just before this one, or maybe it's just after, on the right side, you're going to see this scraggly looking tree in front of this house with the green shutters. This is a horse chestnut. And I'm, I, I now made the mistake of not showing you the blossom. But this is just the blossoms on a horse chestnut are just magnificent. And they probably will be out in about a month, maybe two weeks, depends on the weather. And how do I know it's a horse chestnut? Well, because I went up and I was told it was a horse chestnut and by John McGrath. And then I looked on the ground and I found these fruits, these, these sort of uh, if, uh, spiky uh, uh, out, uh, husks incorporating or, or hiding the, the chestnut on the inside, which is not the chestnut we eat, by the way. This is not, I think, very palatable uh, for us. However, the leaves are unmistakable. This sort of palmate arrangement, meaning it's all springing from a central part of these huge leaves. Uh, there's no other tree around that I know of that looks like this. And when you pass by, look up if the tree does not have leaves. And you can see in the upper left, I've, I've looked up and there was some husks of the, of the nut from last year. So check out the horse, nest, horse chestnut when you go up towards way to the river road. And then when you continue in that same area, you might see this tree, which I'm sure that you know how to tell a sycamore. It's, you know, may have some brownish bark at the bottom, but it, uh, up in the upper regions, it's got this blotchy look, this splotchy, blotchy, brownish, whitish, greenish look. The, the leaf is somewhat maple-like, but we all know these sycamore fruits um, that drop off. And the issue with, and, and we have a number of these sycamores along Main Street between here and Coffin Street or Page School. And I'm in the midst of arguing with somebody very nicely about whether or not it's this something called the London plane tree, which is virtually identical to the American sycamore. The London plane tree was a common planting uh, in urban settings along roadsides. Um, 
and is still because it survives pretty well. The sycamore, the American sycamore likes water, uh, likes moister soils and it can live on, on riverbanks. Very, that's where you find most of them. So what do we make of this tree that's along Main Street? Was it, is it a London plane tree because of where it's planted or is it an American sycamore? We don't know yet because the way you tell is, is there one sycamore uh, fruit in a, in a, on a twig or are there two? This apparently is the only way you can really tell. Oh. So we'll, we'll, we'll revisit this. But for now, my guess is American sycamore and that's what we're gonna call it. So we're traveling along Main Street. Oh, here's just a close up of the bark of sycamore. And you can spot this really from a distance. Uh, you're gonna pass a shagbark hickory which you probably all know, it, there's no other tree that has bark like that. Um, and they are a very common tree in West Newbury. And so we'll turn into page school. Uh, you missed it now because in mid-April I turned into page school and the Japanese flowering cherry was in full bloom right in front of that little annex to the school. And it is just a magnificent tree. So next mid-April, go in and see the a Japanese flowering cherry. And here's just some close-ups I took of the flowers and the, and the bark. Uh, this is typical cherry bark, sort of dark and shiny with these, with these uh, lateral strips of raised tissue. And they're really, they're called lenticels and they're openings in the bark to allow gases to get in because there is some photosynthesis in the, hmm. Uh, inner bark, believe it or not, of cherries and other trees. So when you see these lenticels, they are, they are to let gases to come in for that purpose. Uh, there is a protective layer underneath where the opening is to keep insects from invading. But so you will see lenticels, you see them on birches and on cherries especially. But anyway, visit the Japanese flowering cherry and then we go from Beauty to the Beast. This is Pipe Stave uh, 2020 in the summer. And of course, I went out just the other day to get, a, oops, no, I didn't show you a late picture of it. And it everything looks dead except for some of the bushes down here. So you, you can see how much the crown on this ash has been um, stressed by the, by the emerald ash borer. And we're gonna lose all those. Um, unfortunately. Well, we'll come to Coffin Street, and so you'll turn right on Coffin Street, and you'll see uh, a whole line of black locust, which if you know black locust at all, you can see these leaves are pretty distinctive. They're not toothed, they're just nice little round leaves, um, a leaflets along this big, big leaf, but the fragrance of the blossoms in uh, May, early June, is is magnificent. If you get a chance, unfortunately, Elisa, my wife, is allergic, so I would, I would have these all over the house when they're, um, when they're in blossom because it is a, as powerful as lilacs are. Uh, these are even more powerful and 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 wonderful smelling. It's a tall, skinny tree, and these this bark is just the most, the roughest, most corrugated, most um, uh, deeply furrowed bark that we have that sort of looks like this with these narrow ridges. Tupelo has broader ridges, we'll see those in a minute. Anyway, take a look at the locusts on the left and then we're gonna hit maples. So just like the oaks are a little bit confusing, what about the maples? Well, I put the three here, red sugar and silver that we have. So you can see all the leaves and they are really quite different from each other. Um, the bark is a little bit harder to tell sometimes, but when the leaves are out, you know, the red maple has got these sort of uh, uh, very uh, sharp V-shaped sinuses or, or indentations here. And the tips are very, um, very toothed. Uh, and there are three prominent uh, tips here. Uh, here's the sugar maple, you know, and you can see there are no teeth, it just these really big, uh, if you want to call them teeth or, or points, but uh, you know everything is smooth. Uh, this is, of course, looks like the Canadian flag and, and, and that sort of thing. And then silver maple, which we have, 
is different yet again. It's got these great big rounded sinuses here and almost like bristle tip. So it's, it's, it's almost like a mix between the sinuses of the sugar maple and the tips of the red maple. And that's the silver maple. And these are gigantic trees um, or, and, and are, uh, once you know the color, I'm gonna show you a picture in a minute of the, if you see a tree that looks brilliant, almost like neon green, it's gonna be one of the maples, uh, not red, but probably sugar maple, it could be Norway, but, but in the spring, that, that's that pale green color that comes out that we all love when you look at the landscape. Um, and here's just the oaks by, by comparison, so you can see how different the maple leaves are. Um, how do you identify a maple tree? Well, one of, this is one of the opposite leaf arrangements. So it's maple, ash, and then dogwood, mad, are the three. Uh, so if you look up and you see a lot of twigs that are opposite, it's going to be a maple. This is a mad, red maple. Um, red maples, something red in all seasons. Uh, and we're going to see another slide of, of how the red maple changes color. But you know, that's, this is the first blush of spring. The first evidence the trees are waking up is when we get that nice little red blush to the trees. And those are all red maples. And then we, of course, see, uh, you know, they've got the reddish uh, stems of the leaves. And then we've got this brilliant red color in the fall. So something red in all seasons for the red maple. And here's, here's what I've seen this spring. Um, I've seen you go from this, the, the, the first color in the spring is this, the red maples coming out with these gorgeous flowers. Um, and then after several weeks, they turn brown. And right now there's more or less in the brown stage. Uh, it gets a duller red it, and it's making these winged samaras which come out reddish brown. And this is what the tree looks like. It looks, this is, this is, this, this tree is, is where the picture above it is a close up of. Um, that didn't come out very well, but you can see it just looks brown, but it's almost on its way shortly. And this is today, I took this picture this morning of how that we've gone from bright red to dull red, to brown, and then we come to green. And so it's a great progression if you've got a red maple tree to watch these colors change. But the thing that I love the best is that it is the first tree that comes out with color in the spring. And it, and it flowers first. We don't have leaves coming out first. That comes after the flower. So it's very, it's very clear. Here's, here's the um, sugar maple. So that's the red maple. Here's the sugar maple. Uh, here's one on the left on Coffin Street, and here are, the, here are the, the flowers that give it that greenish hue um, as, you're, as you're driving along. The bark sometimes looks a little twisted. It's a, it's a secondary characteristic, but I call it the pale green of spring, and I believe, yes, here's the picture. So when you're looking at the landscape mm -hmm. in the spring, um, this is maybe a week ago, and I missed the peak. So here we have our white pines <laughs> above. And when you see this beautiful pale green that sometimes in the sunlight is almost a neon green, that's sugar maple. And, you, and once you see that color, you will be shocked at how much uh, the, how many um, maples we have around, uh, sugar maples. Um, I wanted to just, uh, if you don't mind, I want to stop just for a moment and I think I, okay, good. I wanted to double check that it was being recorded, that's all. And by the way, uh, Joyce, Susan, and Diana, um, I, I think you were here when I said feel free to interrupt if you have any questions as we go along. Um, but anyway, I, I just love the colors of the maples in the spring, and I'm watching very carefully the progression of colors this spring, not just a flowering tree like this, like this uh, uh, peach tree down here in my yard, uh, but, but the, against the, the whole uh, 
panorama of trees. And then here's the silver maple on Coffin Street across from my house. And you can see that the flowers are a little different, but this is just a magnificent tree right on the corner here. Um, here's the bark. Uh, it's got some characteristics that you know would be a silver maple that the, st the strips sort of seem like they're coming loose at the bottom a little bit or along the sides. Um, so it gives it a shaggy look, but again, the, the leaf is this, uh, what I think is pretty distinctive. Anyway, so that's a, that's a, you, when you turn in on Coffin Street, you can see sugar maples and silver maples very easily. And if you pass the Cutter's house, you might be fortunate enough to see the magnolia in blossom. Um, it's about over now, but it is just gorgeous and it's close to the road. Um, and it's a, I believe it's a saucer magnolia. And as you continue down towards River Bend, you might see more sugar maples. Look, here they are, look like this on the left side of the road. And we come to River Bend. Now we're gonna see something really different than we saw on Coffin Street because we're now in river bottom territory. We're now in floodplain. We're now where the trees need to be adapted to a wetter environment. So what might be here? Well, and so it's a different suite of trees. Um, and here's the, here's the freshwater tidal marsh about uh, three weeks ago. And one of the th trees that you'll find here very commonly are these American basswood or linden trees, which also have very fragrant flowers. How do you tell? Well, maybe you can see this heart-shaped leaf that's got, you can't see it here, but it's got an un, uh, asymmetrical base. But, you know, they, these leaves are going to be way up in the, in the air. Well, look for this. The, the, these trees commonly are in groups of uh, multi-stemmed groups of trees, not just a single trunk coming out. And then if you look closer, well, you see the bark, you say, well, you know, that looks like ash. I don't know, maybe it's a locust, I don't know. Well, look more closely and you'll see that it's got these vertical strips, but then it's got these horizontal hairline cracks. That is really diagnostic for a basswood or sometimes known as a linden tree. And here, when we come closer, you can see now the cracks pretty clearly on this basswood tree. And they are all over. And I will say also that if you put your hand on this tree, it looks very rough. But I'm telling you that if you put your hand on this, uh, on this area that's uh, highlighted here, it, it will feel almost smooth because the, the ridges are flat topped. They're not pointed like a locust or, or ridged like a locust. They are, um, or, or like uh, a sugar maple. They're, they're almost flat across. So it's, it's a much smoother feel to it as well. Another way to tell. And then of course the opposite is the black locust with these really deep furrows and rough craggy bark. Uh, they're also down uh, along this, the riverbed trail. And then you'll see some red oaks, which uh, the, the bark, if you look in the lower right, has been described as looking like it has ski slopes going up and down. These are long vertical ridges that are a little bit flat topped, but, but not exactly, but they're unbroken. So you've got, um, you've got red oak along river bend here as well. And uh, remember the pin oak had this very narrow distance between the sinuses across the midrib. Well, the red oak has much broader um, uh, distance between them. So, and there are other slight differences, but really this is a case where you probably wanna look at the bark and the shape of the tree. Remember the pin oak has that beautiful shape where the, the, the lower branches point down. Well, you're not gonna see that in the red oak. The red oak also tends to be taller, except for the one that we have on the training ground. Well, um, we, you also are gonna see white oak. We haven't talked about that. Uh, look at the bark, really 
different than the red oak group bark where it's it has these long strips to it that almost look like they might be slightly peeling off although they're hard to to do that with but remember these are not the bristle tips these are the rounded tips on the oak so you can see red oak white oak surprisingly because white oaks usually like it a little drier locust and linden along the river bend trail and the star of the show is the black tupelo if you go just past the bridge that little footbridge that you go over the little rivulet where the indian river comes in and you make a right there's a grove of black tupelo that are just so different and so important for wildlife apparently the number of birds and, and animals that eat these uh, fruits from, on the black tupelo is incredible. And apparently bears love to climb the tupelo trees to get at these berries. Oh. Yeah, you wouldn't think it, but oh. it's, it's I'm not saying here, but where the bears live, it, it's an incredibly important tree for wildlife. So my next tree that I'm gonna plant, I planted oaks and red maples and um, service berries and red buds this year. My next tree is gonna be the black tupelo. Um, this, and this shiny leaf, we haven't seen any leaf. Just think of all the leaves we've looked at. We haven't seen a leaf that even remotely looks like this. There are no teeth, there are no sinuses. Have we seen a glossy leaf like this? This is, a, this is really, uh, a showy leaf and the bark is this incredible furrowed bark they call it alligator bark they say it looks like the back of an alligator um, it's these these ridges that stick out can be almost two inches uh long from where the furrows are in between it, it's really a rough craggy bark and and i'm going to show you one along river road in a moment um, but in the in the fall beautiful red color so visit the two visit the tupelos there, and of course the scientific name is my second most favorite scientific name, which is Nyssa sylvatica. Um, Nyssa, I think, is wood nymph. I mean, sorry, is water nymph, I believe, uh, and sylvatica. Oh, I guess sylvatica is wood or forest, and Nyssa is nymph. So it's sort of wet and in the forest. And that's where you're gonna find the tupelos along our so, so this begs the question, uh, what is your favorite? Uh... Uh, I, I, I can't say. Uh, maybe Eastern white pine because it triggered the American Revolution. Um, mm -hmm. But I got a lot of favorites. <laughs> it's, it's hard to pick up. I'm gonna ask you that same question at the end. Uh, so I'll be thinking about that. Um, and the other thing that you'll see this in a lot of different places is, but down on this river bend trail. So these are trees that we have not talked about before today, during today's talk, um, the black birch. So here we have the typical birch with these lentisoles, these little um, horizontal openings in the bark. This is a young black birch, but look at what happens when it gets old. These, it gets these giant plates that seem to be flaking off and falling off and cracking. Um, it, very, I think, to me, very unmistakable if we're looking at bark. And just to remind you, bark is what we're going to see for our trees for at least half the year. Um, so you'll see that also along Riverbend. Now, if we go, if you come out of Riverbend Park and you don't turn back in Coffin Street, but keep going on River Road, down, um, across from the open field that's there almost just before you get to Rock's uh, Village Bridge. Uh, you see this gigantic tree. This is looking back towards Riverbend, but it's so it's on the, it's, it's not, it, here's the Merrimack over here. Uh, it's a Tupelo and look at the bark on this Tupelo. I mean, this is just incredible bark. And of course you can see those little hairline cracks even. This tree's in big trouble, I think. It's gotten heavily um, uh, pruned by the utility companies and I don't think it's long for this world, but so I would go see it as soon as you can. And you'll also see a river birch right across the way from that big tupelo. Remember, that's the one with this yellow, reddish, peely bark. Um, 
in to me a much more natural setting right along a a a water course if you will well that's river road now we're going to come up out of out of river road and we're going to go back and we're going to come up to log hill farm got three big trees in their yard a uh, two are black oaks and uh, on the right and in the center and then in the left is a is an ash um, you might want to visit them. We won't take time to talk about them very much because I want to get on to the training field. The training field has any number of red maples, so it's a great place to go see red maples in all their glory. Uh, early spring, as we and we've looked at all the colors, the progression of colors. Um, but you also will see this giant pin oak, which is known as the anniversary pin oak or the anniversary tree. Here's a picture of the tree planting ceremony in 1923 of this tree. So this tree is 100 years old and you can see pin oaks, the bottom branches are pointing down, the middle branches are pointing, at least this one is laterally and the upper branches are pointing upward. It's a great example of a pin oak. Uh, there's been some pruning so it's not as perfect a, a, a shape that, uh, of a pin oak as you might otherwise see. But it's a great tree and hopefully it will be around for a long time for more. And there's, there's more history on the tree committee website about this tree. And you'll also see right next to the cannon, this other tree. And this is the problem when you're looking at trees in a planted landscape. My guess is it's a white spruce. I haven't taken a really close look and done some really intensive identification. You can see it's a spruce because of these sharp, uh, these short pointed stiff needles. And the shape is what I associate with a lot of planted white spruce around. It's a, it's, it's a tree that could grow naturally here, although it's, it's really more common in north of here. Uh, I've planted one in my yard and it's doing fine, but you, you don't really know if, you, if it's what species it is, if it's been planted in a landscape like this. My guess is white spruce. So that's what we'll call it for, the, for now. But if you look across the street, you'll see the one that's a lot more common in town, these big giant spruces that sort of have droopy, it, it looks like they're draped almost, these that are hanging down. And you can see the quote by Fergus, uh, the tree looks like it's wearing a thick green robe. This is a Norway spruce. These were planted tr a lot in town when the white pines were harvested uh, in about 1900, uh, or when the um, when the, uh, uh, the the white pine blister rust came in because of the gooseberries and the rust that uses the gooseberries as part of its life cycle and infected the, the white pines. Um, and so we planted a lot of Norway spruces instead of the white pines. And now we have these all over town, these 100 to 125 year old uh, Norway spruces. I think I said white, I meant Norway. And they're very distinctive because of this drooping characteristic uh, at, at the edge of their um, uh, branches. And you can see how the, the, the needles just hang down. They're not, they don't point upward. Like for example, see how the, the ends of the, this spruce point upward. Well, those point, those hang, hang down. Uh, you turn down Bailey's Lane and at the very end before you get to where you can't go any further, you see on the right, just a gorgeous scarlet oak. It's really a landmark tree in my book. Um, I don't have pictures of it in, in leaf yet, but I will. Um, so that's on the right. That's in that group of red, uh, black, scarlet, and pin oak, those, the bristle tips. This is the fourth one. Well, what about town center? Well, just go past the pizza place. And when you hit Whetstone, look up and look over the garage and you see this big giant tree back here. This is one, this is a potentially a state champion tree. Um, it is a balsam poplar. So here's again, looking at it from uh, 
uh, right at the whetstone intersection, a little bit different angle. And then this is from the backyard of the house uh, uh, that it's in back of. And this sits right on the edge of the ridge above whetstone, the whetstone uh, uh, development, or uh, not the whetstone, the Fallensby Lane development. Um, if you were in this tree, you could see New Hampshire. This tree is potentially, I measured it and I submitted it to the state for consideration as the state champion balsam poplar. The balsam poplar is a more northern tree. So we don't have so many around here. Its natural range is a little bit north of here. We used to have more uh, in the earlier days, but as climate is warming, they're, they're not doing so well. And it is more common north of here. Um, but this tree is worth taking a look at as you're going through town off to the right. Uh, my wife tries to have me watch the road and not the trees when I'm driving, but it's hard, um, especially right here with this tree. Well, we'll go down a little further along Main Street. And when we get to Naps, you'll see one of the many copper beaches we have in town. This is in front of the house that's to the left or towards the town, the center of town side of Knapp's Nursery. Um, the center of town is down this way and Knapp's Nursery is just this side of the tree in this picture. And in front of the house, it, it, to me, it looks like elephant legs. That's the way, if, if, you're not, if, you're, if you're not in the season when you can see this beautiful copper colored uh, foliage, uh, you, this trunk is unmistakable and it often splits into these many stems. These are around town in several places. And um, they were really, I believe, purveyed by the uh, uh, Cherry Hill Nursery, probably about a hundred years ago. And so there's one you'll see in one of the descendants of the Thurlows in a minute. Um, she's got a gigantic one in her yard and across the street, right where Moulton hits Cherry Hill, um, there is a row of three of these, uh, right in a row. And so I think that these were, these are all from the um, plantings that were offered by the uh, Cherry Hill Nursery, which uh, went out of business in the year 2000. Anyway, take a look at these copper beaches all around town. And if you then go, keep going towards Pentucket, you see Barbara Hawk's house. And if you look, so this is her pottery shed and barn. And to the left, about a month ago, here is a incredibly beautiful American elm in flower, these sort of stringy pale yellow flowers. And looming above everything else are these black oaks in the, uh, on that hillside. There's one here, and there's one here. And they are, uh, I have submitted these to be cha as state champions as well. Here's the base of this. It's, it's about um, 10 feet. If you take a measuring tape, it's 10 feet around in circumference. So just a gorgeous tree. The, the, the bark is somewhat distinctive where it's these long strips, but they're broken horizontally. But the way that a lot of people tell is if you can find the buds, they have this white, uh, almost looks like fuzzy coating on the buds. Uh, here's the red oak bud, which it's closest relative, very different than what the black oak bud has. That's one way to tell black oak. In addition to the leaves, again, um, this, is, this is usually a little bit skinnier across here than the red oak. And the, and the acorn is quite different than the red oak with this sort of shaggy cap. Anyway, We'll go down to um, uh, Pentucket. Oh, we pass by this uh, on, the, on the left before we get to Pentucket. And you just have to ask yourself, wouldn't it have been better to leave some trees here? Um, there's just no way that this hillside is gonna sustain um, water, keep water, water's not gonna infiltrate. Notice all the white pines above. So we know that this was agricultural at some point all in all likelihood. Well, right across from Pentucket, the entrance to Pentucket, you're gonna see this big, long, skinny spruce. This is one of my favorite trees and its shape is so distinctive. You can see it a mile away. Look at this picture, not from around here. This is on the edge of a Canadian bog 
and you can see all these spire-like trees. And it's a black spruce, and it really likes to be in a wet environment. And the shape is distinctive from far away. Uh, there are other characteristics in terms of the needles and the trunk, but really, if, you, if you're going around and you see a shape like this, it's gonna be, um, remember the, the white spruce was almost uh, conical. Um, the uh, Norway spruce had the drooping branches uh, at the end and this, but it was a fuller tree. Uh, uh, this is just a spire-like tree, uh, just a great tree. Uh, well, let's take just a quick trip up Cherry Hill, and this is this is the Cherry Hill uh, Copper Beach in front of one of the Thurlow descendants' houses, uh, Mia Thurlow, if you know her. Um, just a, a, a magnificent Copper Beach. And just to mention then the other beach, which is our native beach. The Copper Beach is a, the European beach that's been imported. The American beach is the one that's got this smooth gray trunk, often initials in it. And you can see the leaves are not like what we've seen before, uh, sort of these pointed teeth that fit very widely spaced, long narrow leaf. The buds are unmistakable in the winter. These long pointed buds tell you it's a beach. And the smooth gray bark does. Well, and this is what we see in the winter time we see uh, that thin papery, uh, pale tan, fluttery leaves all winter long in our understory. That's, a, that's a, the American beach. That's what it looks like. And I'm sure you, you, when you look through the woods next winter, you'll see these. Well, finally, we're gonna stop at Mill Pond. So we're almost there. We're almost, we, I, I think we've probably done about 27 or almost 30 species by now. Mill Pond, when you pull in, here are the white pines again. Um, and the one thing that you might see that's different than we haven't talked about before is the pitch pine. When you walk up towards Poor House Lane uh, Trail up the hill, not following along the edge of the pond, but going up the hill towards the left or towards the south, you're going to see a lot of these pitch pines, not very much growth down below, a lot of growth at the top, and these, these big red plates. And it's certainly been attack, attacked by um, pine borers over the years, so you're going to see a lot of uh, damaged trees. But this is the red pine, and it's if we were on the Cape, this would be our primary pine, not the white pine. This loves sandy soil, open scrubby areas. And notice the cones are not the long curved cones. They're these short, fat, roundish cones. And remember, pitch pine has how many uh, needles? Two. Three strikes and you're out, right? Uh, oh, three. Right? Baseball. You got to think baseball. Three yeah. strikes and you're out. Absolutely. Right. Um, yeah. Two is the red. Three is the pitch and five are the white. Um, so how about this? We're now up climbing the hill towards Poor House Trail, almost done. Uh, old growth? Well, no. maybe, maybe in 50 to 75 years. You don't really get old growth till 200 years. You start to see some characteristics in 150. And if you recall last night's talk on the history, most of our trees are 125 years old in that range. So we're getting there. We're getting there. How about, uh, how about this area? Oh, this is the Old Town Forest where they planted all these white pines in 1925. So this is 100 years old. Well, maybe in 100, maybe 75 or 100 years, we'll get some old growth there. Uh, here's Poor House Lane Trail through the woods, absolutely gorgeous. And the white pines and the, I'm sorry, the white oaks and the red oaks line the, um, line the trail. So it's just, so do you have a favorite tree? That's the question. Ooh, that's a hard question. Isn't it though? That was sure. I have to say that I, I really love 
the American elm in the wintertime. It's just a spot of color that just kind of brightens everything up. In the summertime, it's easy to ignore. It's, it, you know, it's just there. Yeah. But in the wintertime, it, I, and I have, actually my neighbor has three of them that are nice. right, up, right outside my window. And I just love looking at those trees there. And yeah. And that's, that's, and if I were to say what my favorite tree is, it might be this one, which is the one right that I see every morning when I get up mm -hmm. and it's a scarlet oak. And so, you know, part of it is what the landscape sort of uh, significance is to you. Uh, Joyce, did you, did you have something? Yeah, I'm trying to get back where you'll, uh, it's actually Joyce and Steve. My husband, Steve is watching. Hello. Hi. Hi, this has been wonderful. Um, boy, I, I guess I'd have to say um, the maple. We, we have a nice sugar maple out back, but oh, yeah. I, do, I do love the flowering cherries in the spring. Yeah. So maybe those two. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to pick, isn't it? Uh, well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Susan, Diana, or Ted, do you, you want to chime in on a favorite tree? Okay, well, that's fine. Um, it, it's, you know, that there are many reasons to pick favorite trees. Um, but I want to wish you happy Arbor Day. This is my uh, bur oak that I just planted um, th a couple days ago, and I'm hopeful that it will survive. Um, and so let's plant a tree. And absolutely will. <laughs> that's the end of our tour. So thank you very much for bearing with me. I hope I know it was a lot of information, but um, hopefully it intrigued you to look a little further into something uh, that, oh, that we covered. Fred, it uh, was wonderful, and I, I loved the way you did it because, of course, we all drive down one thirteen, but then I also drive down Coffin Street and River. Road. <laughs> so you, you sort of took me on a tour of my normal uh, <laughs> way of going through things. And I, I will, uh, there was one tree, let me see. I, I'm not, I'm not, yeah, horse chestnut. I don't know if you remember this or not, but there was a magnificent horse chestnut on Coffin Street next to that little old house. That I can never figure out, does anybody own that house? Or it, uh, it, you know which one I'm talking about? It's this, this little old sort of abandoned looking house. Yeah, but yeah. Somebody it, takes care of it. I, I'm not sure exactly. It, it's a strange it's a strange one I, i'll have to look and see is it is it is there any remnant of it left or uh you know every spring i look and it in summer and i at one point i think they lost a big chunk of it and i don't know if they lost the whole thing or not but i used to just look forward to turning on coffin street and seeing that tree it was so wonderful yeah i and will and it's not will, there will, and it's all its glory anymore. I don't know whatever happened to the yeah, rest of it. I will keep my eye open. If you go a little further, um, when you pass the Scott's house on the left where the sugar maples are, right by the barn, right next to where the horses are, there's a horse chestnut there. Hmm. And, and that's on the left side as you're going towards River Road. Yeah. Okay. So keep, keep your eyes out on that one. That one is not yet doing anything in terms of budding or anything. So. So we've got that to look for. Sort of have to have to wait, yeah. Yeah. And and the other the other thing I'll mention is you mentioned the uh, the shag bark hickories and you know I, I I love my trees and I love the trees in West Newbury but like I said I I've never been very good at tree identification I'm an appreciator but but not a an expert by any means and I was out working in the yard one day and all of a sudden I looked at this tree and I said that's got to be a shag bark hickory look at that bark. <laughs> Well, was, good for you. This revelation that I had. <laughs> well, you know that's that's the whole purpose of of all that I do is just to try to have everyone increase their appreciation of what's around or where they are, even if it's just a little bit. You know, it it the more you can know about things and appreciate them, the more enjoyment you get. Uh, so, but, but, but we will try not to, <laughs> not to have too many accidents along on 13. As we're <laughs> Look at the trees, okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, but, 
but yeah, do, do um, and if and if you want to know what a tree is, uh, take a picture of it, send it to me, um, and uh, uh, you know, send the picture, and and I can help you out. Maybe we'll see. It, it's it's okay. just fun. Yes, it is. It's lots of fun. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for for thank coming. You. And I, I hope I hope you all got to go to, to pick up a, one of the Dawn Wed, Redwoods this morning by the library um, at the giveaway. And so we'll we'll maybe we'll have some pictures of those next time. All right. Well, listen. Take care, everybody. Thank you for bearing with me. And I uh, hope you I hope you enjoy got something out of the uh, the talk. I did. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.